So I got the pleasure of introducing our next speaker, uh, Jeff Susna. Uh, Jeff and I go back. Uh, Jeff actually said that if I say anything mean about him, he's going to walk out and leave. So it's up to you guys. Do you want 45 minutes of your day back, or do you want to hear Jeff? <laughs> uh, Jeff, okay, sorry. Uh, but Jeff is a really interesting guy, and the way I kind of look at Jeff sometimes is um, he's been very forward-thinking in the Minneapolis community. He's worked with many of the large companies in Minneapolis and doing consulting for them. Uh, but what's interesting about Jeff is he's one of those people in your community that is probably way too far ahead of you sometimes and you don't really understand what he's saying and what he's, <laughs> what he's talking about. And then two years later, you finally catch up to him and you're like, ah, that Jeff guy, he was actually pretty smart. <laughs> uh, so without further ado, uh, Jeff, do you want to get your, oh, <laughs> come on, Jeff. Um, so, Jeff and I uh, like to uh, get on each other uh, over Twitter, and uh, Jeff has given me the handle of the Newman of DevOps, or the Newman of Cloud. And I actually had, and, and so that must make him, I think he's more the Kramer <laughs> than the Seinfeld. <laughs> but that means, if you're a Kramer, that means we're like partners in crime. So yeah, probably more like Jerry. Um, and I actually have a shirt that says pure evil as a service. <laughs> and I meant, to, I meant to wear it this morning for Jeff, but. How late were you at the bar last night? Um, I got back to my hotel about 3.30. <laughs> Holding it together though. Can people hear me? Yep. All right. All right. Jeff. So um, before I start, um, I want to say that um, I'm personally really, really proud of this community right now. I think the quality of the talks and the open spaces and the hallway conversations yesterday was really outstanding. And there was a level of intensity and energy and interaction that was wonderful. And to be honest, it was a little un-Minnesotan. Um, what was Minnesotan is a sense of practical, down-to-earth, uh, no BS discussion going on, which was really great. And so this morning, I'm going to violate that. Um, I'm going to get a little out there, and I'm going to get a little up in the clouds. Um, and Michael, you kind of gave away my secret, which is I tend to get a little out there. So bear with me, and hopefully you'll enjoy the ride. Um, Slimmin, are you here this morning? All right, good. Um, I didn't realize when I looked at the schedule that I'm giving the hangover talk. Um, <laughs> so if you come up afterwards and say, what the hell were you talking about, I can blame it on you. Say, well, you drank too much. My talk was really obvious. Um, so bef before I start, Dan, I need to issue a personal apology. I'm really sorry there will be no math today in this presentation. Um, what I do want to do is I want to introduce uh, promise theory. I want to give a somewhat poetic introduction to what promise theory is. And then I'm going to completely change gears and I'm going to talk about service and what that is. Um, and then explore how promise theory can help us deliver higher quality service, which from my perspective is really what DevOps is about. So let's start with a claim, which is to understand complex socio-technical systems, you have to understand teenagers. And I'll illustrate that with a story. Uh, imagine you're hosting a party. Uh, it's at night. It's Minnesota, so there's a good chance that it'll be cold. Uh, people will come wearing coats. They need a place to put their coats. And you'd like to put them on the bed in your teenage son's bedroom, but of course his bedroom is pigsty. So you need him to clean his room. So you say, Johnny, can you please clean your room today so we can use it to put coats for the party? And he says, I promise I'll do it before dinner. So what just happened? Well, first of all, he formed an intention. He decided he was going to do something. 
Secondly, he stated his intention to you because if he just stands there kind of staring into space thinking, well, I'll clean my room before dinner, that doesn't actually do you any good. Third, there is a level of intensity and commitment to his statement. He doesn't say, yeah, 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 I'll do it before dinner, don't bug me. He says, I promise. And finally, he promises to do something that is of benefit or of value or of service to you. Again, if he says, I promise I'll listen to Pink Floyd in my room while you guys have a party, that doesn't do anything for you. So we can define a promise as a strongly stated intention to provide service. Now, at this point, I have to make a confession. Um, Mark Burgess conceived promise theory. Uh, he brought it back to us from the future along with other wonderful and amazing things like computer immunology and CF engine. And he introduced me to it through an article he wrote called Promise You a Rose Garden. And I read it and I thought to myself, this is lovely, it's beautiful, it's poetic. I have no idea what the guy's talking about. Um, and after he walked me through it a few more times, it, it, it suddenly hit me that the reason I was missing it was because it was right in front of me. Um, and it was right in the words. And the words were profound. And the reason that they were profound is because they mean the same thing in ordinary usage as they do in technical usage. And they mean the same thing across different domains. So to understand promise theory, we really need to look at this word promise. And in particular, why that word? Why not obligation theory or requirement theory or something like that? <clears throat> well, the thing about promises is they aren't always kept. Sometimes promises get broken. Uh, those of you who have teenagers or who have had teenagers will now understand why I'm using that particular example. Because you know that teenagers don't always keep their promises. I promise I'll clean my room. I promise I'll be home before midnight. I promise I won't smoke pot at the hip hop concert, so on and so forth. So we need to refine our definition a little bit to a strongly stated intention to provide service that may or may not come to pass. So promise theory makes uncertainty explicit and makes it something that we actually think about and talk about. And we can see this even in seemingly deterministic things like computers. Um, we had an example just this morning um, where Michael's software broke its promise to save his file and as a result he had a blank slide. Um, generally, operating systems work very, very hard to keep their promise to store our data. You know, if you write something to a file, the operating system is making a promise to you, which is if you come back later and ask it what's lo in location 23 in this file and you said it was foo, it'll still be foo. And 99 times out of 100, it keeps its promise. But every once in a while, something goes wrong. Plug gets pulled during a write, there's a subtle bug in the software, so on and so forth. And as a result, we do things to work around that, you know, replication, backup, what have you. So let's continue with our story and we'll find out the next word that we need to understand. So one of you goes off to run errands for the party. You go to the liquor store to get some good craft beer, you buy napkins, so on and so forth. You're done, you're on your way home, you call your spouse and say, hey, I'm sorry it took so long, uh, there was a long line at the liquor store, but I'm done, I'm on my way home, how are things going? And your spouse says, well, not very well. Johnny's sound asleep, he hasn't started cleaning his room, he's not gonna get it done in time, I'm gonna have to do it and I'm really annoyed. And at that point, you say something really interesting. You don't say, well, I'll kick his ass when I get home. Instead, you say, well, you know, dear, that Johnny doesn't keep his promises half the time, so you really shouldn't be surprised. And maybe you needed to make a contingency plan of wake him up, set his alarm, uh, leave time to do it yourself if you had to, uh, make sure I'm home early in case I need to do it, um, what have you. And the thing about making uncertainty explicit is that it puts the onus on us to evaluate the trustworthiness of the promise and the promiser and to account for that. Um, and to quickly complete our story, your spouse says back to you, yeah, 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 I know, but you know that Johnny's been a lot better lately. And these days, when he makes a promise, he generally keeps it. So I figured I didn't have to worry about it. I could rely on him to get it done. And that tells us that, that trust and evaluating the trust of a promise is a dynamic, ongoing process. It's not static. 
Good software, bad software, good employee, bad employee, good teenager, bad teenager. Again, if you have teenagers, you know that from one day to the next, you never know whether you're going to get the 30-year-old or the three-year-old. So the power of promise theory comes from Mark Burgess's observation that many real-world systems behave in terms of autonomous agents that voluntarily cooperate to get things done by making and sometimes keeping promises to each other. And when we make uncertainty explicit and we deal with the possibility of failure at the component level, we can ironically create more certain systems. And we see this actually all the time in the kinds of systems we're building now. You know, a website makes a promise, which is regardless of how many other people are coming to the site, I'll give you back a web page in so many milliseconds. And you have an auto-scaling load balancer that's happily chunking along, and all of a sudden it looks at the traffic pattern and goes, oh shit, pretty soon the servers I have at my disposal aren't going to be able to keep my promise anymore, so I better spin up another one. If you look at the circuit breaker pattern, it's a perfect example of dynamic evaluation of trust. This service that I depend on might not keep its promise to give me data back within the required latency, and if it doesn't, I'll cut it off. But then I'll keep my eye on it, and if it gets better again, I'll let it back in. When you think about continuous integration, as developers, we make a promise to each other. I won't check in code that will break the regression tests or that will break your code. But guess what? We break that promise all the time. And so the reason we have things like Jenkins and JUnit and JUnit Report and all of that good stuff is to catch these broken promises and give us an opportunity to repair them. When you think about design for fail, at all levels, all the way from infrastructure on up to UX and beyond, what it's really saying is I have to keep my promise to the layer above me regardless of whether the layer below me is keeping its promise. So we might even rename it, you know, design for broken promises. The next thing is that when we treat systems as made up of autonomous components, we can achieve greater scalability and greater resilience. And microservices, both as an architectural pattern and organizational pattern, are very much about this. By breaking a monolithic thing into a bunch of smaller parts that can have loosely coupled, hands-off, um, promise-based relationships with each other, the system as a whole becomes more resilient and scalable. When you think about self-organizing teams in the context of Agile, you know, there's actually something missing there. Um, in nature, systems don't organize themselves in order to do what they're told. They organize themselves in order to accomplish some kind of internal goal. And when we get to scaling Agile, it seems like we kind of forget everything that we knew. You know, Agile is this wonderful mechanism that allows us to succeed in uncertain, unknown, changing, sloppy environments. But when we think at the larger scale, we, we get afraid and we think that we have to kind of glue everything together into some kind of big Rube Goldberg device. Because, well, we have features and those features cross teams and those features ne need to get released on time and they need to get on the release train or things will go wrong. So how else can we do it? My father was an architect, so I grew up listening to him talk around the dinner table about managing construction projects. And guess what? They're all about managing uncertainty. Painter falls off the ladder, breaks his leg, can't paint for two weeks. What are you going to do? Dock strike in Brazil. Um, the teak delivery is delayed. What are you going to do? You still have to keep your promise so that the client can move into the house, that they can afford to pay with their mortgage on time. And so you deal with the fact that you have all of these subcontractors doing stuff and they don't always keep their promises and you have to figure out what to do anyway. So we tend to think about systems and we tend to think about groups when we're building and running software in terms of requirements. But we can actually think about them much more powerfully if we understand the whole equation, which is that as teams we make promises voluntarily as autonomous, intelligent human beings in response to external needs. So let's change gears now. I'm going to tell another completely unrelated story. This time you're a weary traveler and you've just showed up at a hotel. And you're going to check in and you're not in a very good mood. Your flight was delayed. There was terrible turbulence. 
The cabbie on the way from the airport was a nut job. And you go up to the desk, and the clerk says, I'm really sorry I can't check you in right now because our computer system is down. What we have here is a service failure. But in order to understand the true nature of that failure and how to fix it, we need to know something about what service really even is. First of all, service unfolds as an experience that happens over time across multiple touch points. It's not a thing. So your interaction with a hotel starts when you go online and you try to reserve a room and the website is slow and clunky and they don't have the rooms that you want. And then you show up to check in and the computer system's down. You finally get checked in, you go to your room, you turn on the TV, they have these lousy basic cable channels and movies are $83 a piece. Um, you log on to Wi-Fi and it's unusably slow. You can't sleep because somebody's using the ice machine next to your room. And finally you check out the next morning and you're just really happy to leave. Secondly, service is a relationship and not a transaction. You know, when people go on Twitter and they complain about United, they don't say, my flight was delayed, I'm really annoyed. They say, as usual, my flight was delayed, I'm really annoyed. Or they say, shocker, news flash, for the first time and as long as I can remember, my flight wasn't delayed. And finally, and this is the most subtle and actually the most important part, is service value isn't something that you give to a customer in exchange for money. It's something that gets created collaboratively together and it's not really manifest until the customer actually shows up. The simple fact that you own a hotel and you sell somebody a room doesn't do anybody any good until they come and they stay in your hotel and they have a good experience or a bad experience. So what this means is that when you're in the service business, you're making a promise. And the promise you're making is actually to help your customer accomplish some larger goal. Um, I heard a wonderful comment from a designer at Airbnb. She said, we realized that the product was the trip. In other words, you don't rent a room in a hotel because you want to rent a room in a hotel. Um, you get a room in a hotel because you need a place to sleep while you're on your trip. And that's actually the business that the service provider is in. And this experiential, holistic nature of service means that the entire organization has to collaborate in order to keep the promise to the customer. And now that we're living in this digital economy and every business is a digital business, what it means is that the quality of your brand becomes inseparable from the quality of your business and your technical operations. And we have, ah, so let's just for a second uh, jump back to our previous story, and there's actually a complex set of promises that have to be kept in order to have a good party. Um, the root promise of why you throw a party is to help your friends have a nice time on a Friday night, forget their troubles, catch up with their friends, have some good food and drink. And in order to do that, there are a bunch of other promises that have to be kept. You have to clean your house, you have to cook the hors d'oeuvres, Johnny has to clean his room, one of you has to go to the liquor store and get some good craft beer. Um, and interestingly, it actually extends even beyond you. So in order for you to serve your friends good beer, the liquor store has to exist. The liquor store owner has to know how to run a profitable bu business, and they have to have good taste in beer so that you can keep your promises. So when I show up at a hotel, what is it that I'm trying to accomplish? Am I trying to check into my room and get my room key? Not really. What I'm really trying to do is make this transition from stress and travel to rest and relaxation. And we all know this. You show up at a hotel after you've been flying and there's this last little bit of anxiety. You just want to get to your room. You want to drop your luggage and relax and take your shoes off and watch TV. So if the receptionist just says to you, I can't check you in because the computer system is down, They've made the wrong promise. They are acting actually as a dumb interface. What they're really saying is, I promise to accurately translate the words that come out of your mouth into commands that the computer will understand. So the failure is they're promising the wrong thing. If they understand that their real promise is to help you make this transition, well, maybe there are other things they can do. Maybe they have some rooms set aside that they track on pencil and paper. 
Or maybe they do something even simpler, which is they just say, you know what, computer system's down, the IT guys say it'll be back up in 20 minutes. Why don't you leave your luggage with me, go to the bar, have a drink, have some hors d'oeuvres on us, and I'll come get you um, when your room is ready. The customer satisfaction level is much higher, even though the computer system is still down. So how can promise theory help with the quality of digital service? Well, it offers a language that we can use to ask questions about what we're trying to do it and how to do it well. So the first question is not that or that. What promises should we be making? You know, in software we say that um, no matter how good your code is, if you write the wrong code, it doesn't matter. So ma how matter how well you keep your promises, if you're making the wrong promises, it doesn't matter. What promises do we need others to make? What help do we need? What do we need the reservation system to do? What do we need the check-in system to do? What does development need ops to do? What does ops need development to do? What do we do to maximize the trustworthiness of our promises? How do we make sure that we keep them even though other systems around us may not be keeping theirs? And finally, and this is extra credit, but it really should be the first question you ask. What promises do our customers need to make? You know, when you're, when you're co-creating value, when you're helping your customer accomplish something, you're in effect helping them keep your promise, their promises. So why do I need this room in a hotel? Because I promised to give a kick-ass talk on promise theory in the morning. Or I promised to show my kids a good time in Disney World. Uh, or I promised to close the big deal and make my quarterly sales numbers. So if we go back and we look at our hotel example from the perspective of promise theory, so the first root promise is that we're promising to help somebody rest as part of their trip. And in order to do that, the first thing is they have to be able to get a room. And they have to be able to get a room, not just any room, but a room that meets their needs. I need a king-size bed. I need two rooms because I have three kids. I smoke. I don't smoke. Uh, I'm afraid of heights. I don't want one on a high floor. And what's interesting is as we look at these promise chains and, and how they break down, they don't necessarily break down along org chart boundaries, that we will see dev and ops and UX um, promises bundled together. And in the context of the hotel, we'll even see physical world and virtual world promises together. So I have usability issues, I have functionality issues, I have operability issues, I have security issues, all bundled in this promise of helping somebody find a room. If you're like me, when you show up at a hotel and it's late and you've been traveling and you're not very good at navigating physical spaces, the first challenge is to find the reception desk. And if the hotel lobby is confusing or mysterious, you have a, a broken micro-promise right there. And then you encounter the human. And again, you don't want the human to promise to be a dumb terminal. You want them to be a human and be friendly and helpful and intelligent and be able to make decisions. They need a promise from the check-in system. And again, the interesting thing here is if we think about this, the company and the customer creating value together, that means that internal users are actually customers too. And we have to think about the software that we build and run for them the same way as the software we build and run for the end customers. So we have usability issues, we have functionality issues, we have operability issues there as well. And then finally, we have this larger context. You know, I have frequent flyer miles. Uh, I need to get a taxi when I leave. Uh, I want to find a restaurant. I want to be a, why do I want, want Wi-Fi? Why, why do we all complain about slow Wi-Fi in our hotel rooms? Because we need to get some work done, right? Because we're traveling on business and we need to check our email and we need to get the PowerPoints done, so on and so forth. So that's all part of the technical promises that we need in order to make this experience work. So the bottom line is that promise theory helps us span boundaries in our thinking. 
It helps us think across both horizontal and vertical silos and across scales. It helps us think across disciplines and perspectives. It helps us think across the provider and the customer. You know, we hear this, all this talk about how, well, in IT, we have to start thinking about the business, and we have to start thinking about the customer. Well, how do we do that? And it helps us think across the external ecosystems that we have to work with in order to get our jobs done. And that might be clouds, and it might be partners, and who knows what. So in closing, I found myself thinking about, OK, well, what, what is, what's the relationship between DevOps and promise theory? You know, how does this all come together? Isn't it, is it even relevant? And intuitively, I thought that it was, but I couldn't put my finger on it for a while. And then it, it struck me that it's, it's like the relationship between a river and the ocean. You know, DevOps was very concisely expressed to me as systems thinking. And it's systems thinking applied to a particular part of the overall service problem. And we could express it in promise theory terms as rethinking the promises that dev and ops make to each other. And that together, they make to the larger business and to customers. And even the idea that dev and ops are making a joint promise of some sort to provide software that works and runs and is secure and doesn't fall down, um, that in itself is kind of a rethinking. And you know, some people in the community have started to have the conversation that, well, maybe we need to expand the scope of DevOps. Do we need DevNet Ops? Do we need DevSecOps? You know, we got a talk yesterday by Benjamin that was basically about DevSecOps. Do we need biz DevOps? You know, and it kind of goes on and it grows and it morphs, and the, the, the word, the portmanteau gets bigger and longer. And so if you, if you actually encode the entire string um, of all of the components we need to deliver service, and you know, the reason that I sort of wandered through these, you know, strange and different and seeming irrelevant examples of throwing parties and, and staying in hotels is because we're in the service business, we're not just in the software business, and we're part of something larger, and if our customers are going to succeed, at some level we need to think about the whole thing together. So if we encode that whole thing, and we think about all of the components and all of the relationships, and all of the mutual promises that have to be made in order for this to succeed, we end up starting to engage in, in thinking and promises or promise thinking um, at a very holistic and global level. So on that note, um, thank you very much. I want to leave you with some homework. Um, if you haven't read, if, if you think I'm in the future, um, you really need to read Mark Burgess's book, uh, in Search of Certainty, it's, it's really far in the future. Um, it talks about promise theory, it's, it's very wonderful, and it talks about thinking about systems and thinking about software systems in a very comprehensive way. Um, if you want to understand the elegant and beautiful formal logic underlying promise theory, it's not particularly complicated or opaque. Um, Mark wrote a book with John Bergstra called, fittingly, Promise Theory. And then if you just want to have your mind completely blown and forced to rethink the whole idea of how humans interact with, with each other in the context of computers and how we give up and how we shouldn't give up our autonomy and our intelligence as humans, um, for me at least, uh, when I read Understanding Computers and Cognition by Juana Grad and Flores, which is a seminal book that was written about 30 years ago at this point, um, for me, at least, it was a life-changing experience, so I recommend it for everyone. So, thank you very much. Is this on? Yes. 
Oh, we want to give people an opportunity to ask Jeff questions. So I think we may have, uh, I'm not sure if we have a mic upstairs right at this moment, but let's see who has questions up here. Everyone wants to just go back to sleep. Everyone's taking it in. Everyone's <laughs> thinking about the homework. <laughs> Have you put it to use as a consultant? I have. Um, and it, it, interesting, um, in the context of a project of uh, kernel patching of all incredibly sort of high-minded esoteric things, um, and a situation where we weren't able to patch all of the servers every month. And so we spun up a project to try and do better. And the way we were going to do it was through automation. And we started writing these requirements. And then I sat down and I thought about it. OK, what, what does this look like from a promise perspective? Right? What's the root promise? And I wrote down, we promise to patch every server every month. And I just kind of went, that's it. That's like really challenging. And it's something that the patching group needs to sign up for and wants to sign up for. And once they start understanding that that's, that's what we're, we're going to promise to do, it kind of brought everything into a whole new focus. Did you have a question? Have you tried to explain that to uh, any of the, the business teams or the, the project owners? And do they understand that piece of, well, don't just look at this as a requirement, but look at this as a, a, a really a larger set of uh, promises that you're, you're going to deliver. Um, I think it's early stages. And I think that um, I was intentionally controversial in the slide when I talked about Agile, um, because I think there's another shoe that has to drop in that world. And I think it, it really remains to be seen where that goes and the whole, the whole idea of thinking about needs and promises instead of requirements. And to me, when I, I'm kind of flummoxed by the whole conversation about self-organizing teams, it's like if you're self-organizing so you can go stand at the stand-up and head your, hang your head in shame because you didn't make the right burn-down chart, that's not really self-organizing. Um, so oh, no, 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 no. So he's not allowed to ask questions. <laughs> so I, I really, uh, I found kind of um, the last question you asked, which is uh, kind of what's the root promise? Kind of like uh, kind of re-exploring root cause analysis in essence, uh, which, which makes me think, how do you keep these conversations from just becoming causal, causal chains so the promises become commitments? Like... It seems so uh, like a, such a subtle balance to continuously bring people back to the difference between a commitment and a promise. How, how, when you're having conversations, how do you? Well, maybe do that? the maybe the word "root" isn't a good word because it has connotations that I don't really mean. Um, and my my uh, glib answer would be that the way you do that is through empathy. And what I really mean by that is the point of it is. OK, forget about what I'm trying to build. What is my customer trying to accomplish? Right? Why did they show up in my hotel? Right? If my hotel burned to the ground, what could they not do that they need to? So it's really about thinking about things from your customer's perspective. What do they need from me? And you know, that's, a, that's a design question. So there isn't a you know, provably correct answer. And that's not really the point. Hey, we have time for one more question. So earlier in the, the talk, you talked about um, trust and how you constantly reevaluate levels of trust. Mm -hmm. How do you deal with uh, quantifying broken promises and measuring uh, trust as an ongoing practice? Uh, what do you mean by quant? You mean how badly was the promise broken or how often was it broken? Yeah, I mean, any, anything to, with, uh, you know, how, you know, I, are people over-promising? Do you need to reassess the promises that, uh, that are in inherent in the system? 
you know, how do, how do you correct for mistaken promises? Um, well, that's a really good question, and one thing that I didn't talk about is, you know, along with everything else that we design, I don't think what you want to do is do this nice promise chain map and print it on a plotter and put it up on the wall and say, okay, for the next five years, we're executing on these promises. So, like anything else, you know, like if you're doing BDD, you have the same issue, right? Do we even have the right user stories? Have we, we understood our customer this way a year ago, do we need to understand them differently this year? So I think that's, I don't have a good answer to that other than that, uh, yes, it's, that's a dynamic thing. And, and, you know, promise theory isn't intended to be a perspective. It's not intended to be a prescriptive rule set of do this, do it twice a year, and you're done kind of thing. All right, thank you. Could we get another round of applause for Jeff?